bad people are a problem. Every single day, we see evidence that bad people are a very real and very dangerous problem within society. These people are scammers, killers, torturers, rapists, and, if you ask most people, politicians. But no matter what kind of bad a person is, there is one guarantee. Bad people are infinitely more dangerous when they band together. My name is Brianne, and I'm the host and creator of Among the Dirt and Trees, a show where we explore true crime cases that occur out in nature. In today's episode, we're going to discuss Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker, famously known as the Toolbox Killers. These two absolute monsters were that special blend of pathetic and twisted that makes so many killers so dangerous. Today's episode landed in my lap while I was innocently researching Halloween cases. As you all know, it is officially spooky month. Which means that basically nothing matters unless it has a pumpkin on it or it is sold at Spirit, which is a prominent Halloween store chain for those of you who don't have them near you. I was looking for something spooky and fun and ended up uncovering easily one of the worst cases that I have covered on the show. So here is your official warning. I know that you all signed up to listen to a true crime podcast, but I feel like I do need to warn you that the nature of these crimes is exceptionally graphic and violent. So if you are sensitive to that at all, this might not be the best episode for you. Now let's do this. Roy Norris and Lawrence Bittaker were two young men who were very adept at getting themselves into trouble. Norris was a Colorado native who was bounced around in foster care and had a clear trail of mental health concerns, including a failed suicide attempt. He joined the U.S. Navy during the Vietnam War, but was honorably discharged after his first tour for unexplained reasons, despite never seeing combat, which some speculate had to do with his mental health problems. Bittaker, on the other hand, was from Pennsylvania and started his life of crime as a preteen. He was placed into juvenile centers and eventually abandoned by his adoptive family. These two committed various crimes, ultimately placing them in the same prison, the California Men's Colony. During this time, they bonded. Now, I'm a person who really enjoys connecting with other people, and I'm always looking for shared points of connection. I might ask if someone likes reading a popular TV show or maybe something like hiking or Halloween. Norris and Bittaker bonded over their obsessive hatred for women and their fantasies of rape and sexual assault. Fantasies that Norris had already taken part in. Norris loved making women feel afraid, and once reportedly attempted to come on to a woman in his family. These two sat in prison, fueling each other's fantasies and talking about how great it would be to rape and murder women when they were released. Eventually, both of these predators were released, and they reconnected as promised. This is when they started planning. They purchased a van and started scouting for locations to pick up girls. 
California was an easy place to roam because in the 70s and 80s, there was a constant flow of partying young women who were commonly hitchhiking. The two men found a good place to pick up girls and then started their next search. Having a place to find a victim was important, but they needed somewhere to stash the bodies when they were done. They settled on a location in the San Gabriel Mountains. With all of these pieces in place, they were almost ready to carry out their sick crimes, but they wanted one more bit of certainty. And I think that this is one of the most twisted things about these absolutely horrific crimes. Both legally and just in general, I think a lot of us put a pretty distinct focus on intent when it comes to crimes. We often see a difference between someone who kills in the spur of the moment as opposed to someone who kills as a part of a detailed plan. Both are obviously awful, but someone actively planning out a murder just has something to it that really makes my skin crawl. And this kind of takes the cake. These men didn't just plan out their hunting grounds and their dumping grounds. They ran a few practice trials first. To ensure that they could get girls as easily as they hoped, they started picking up young women in the area. They would give them rides and take them to party with them, but they didn't hurt them. They just took pictures of them. It wasn't time to hurt anyone yet. I can't imagine being one of the women who later realized that the guys that picked them up and partied with them were practicing to rape and kill women down the line. Imagine being that close to an unimaginably painful and violent death. But the trials worked. The girls got in their cars, and eventually they felt confident that their plans would work. They built a bed in the van and filled it with instruments to torture their victims. The murders began. Norris and Bittaker committed five murders, as far as we know, but the number is suspected to be higher based on police evidence. And the way they carried out these murders is how they got their media nickname. These two were abducting women, raping them, and torturing them with tools from a toolbox. To make it even worse, they took pictures and even some videos of pretty much everything that they did. The first victim was Lucinda Schaefer, a 16-year-old girl who left a church meeting and never made it home. Bittaker had asked Lucinda out on a date, and she had declined him. When they tried to get Lucinda into their van, she declined. She knew better. So they followed her and drove past her, pulling off to the side of the road. When she walked by, they spoke to her, grabbed her, and dragged her into the van. After violently attacking her, during which she was reportedly very calm, they each attempted to strangle her and failed. In the end, they tightened a wire coat hanger around her neck until she died and threw her body off a cliff. Their second victim was Andrea Hall, an 18-year-old who was hitchhiking. They offered her a ride, but when another car pulled up and offered her a ride too, she went with the other car. Norris and Bittaker followed her to the beach, and then Bittaker pretended he was the only one in the van, asking her if she wanted something to drink. When she went to grab it, 
they attacked her. They dragged her off into the woods, later demanding that she come up with as many reasons as she could for them not to kill her. She tried, but while she was talking, they slammed ice picks into her ears and then strangled her. Once again, they threw her off a cliff. Their next two victims were traveling together. Their names were Jacqueline Lamp and Jackie Gilliam, and they realized after they accepted a ride with these two men that something was wrong. The men promised to drive them to the beach, but ended up driving in the wrong direction, which tipped them off. The girls attempted to escape, but they were violently attacked and subdued. Surprisingly, reports say that witnesses saw the struggle and did nothing. But this really isn't all that surprising. This is an example of what we call the bystander effect, a theory in psychology that suggests that people are less likely to intervene if there are other people there, too. It is exactly as terrifying as it sounds, but the show What Would You Do, which I actually believe has been canceled by now, is somewhat based on this, and it will do a really good job of making you really upset and then giving you some hope, so at least there's that. No one even called the cops over these two girls being attacked. Emboldened by everyone's lack of action, Norris and Bittaker kept these girls for almost two days. These young women were extensively raped and tortured before being violently murdered. Their final victim, who led me to this case, was found on Halloween night in 1979. Her name was Shirley Ledford, and she was 16 years old. Like the other girls, Shirley was hitchhiking, this time after leaving a Halloween party. But Shirley wasn't a stranger. She was a waitress at a local restaurant that Bittaker loved, and she accepted a ride with them because she felt that she knew him. There is a 17-minute video of them torturing her while she screams that was so bad that reports say people in the courtroom were sobbing, sick, and hysterical. After hours of abuse, they killed her and threw her body into a home's lawn and then just drove off. The full details of what happened to each of these girls is available online, but I'm not going to go into it any more than I already have. I've said it before, but I have no problem with fictional gore. I will eat a rare steak while watching Sweeney Todd. I will watch a monster slurp up someone's skin like a piece of pasta. When something isn't real, I have no problem with it, but these were real girls, and... Truly terrible things happen to them. So, how did we catch these two monsters? Well, Shirley's murder broke their pattern, and it was highly public. Before she was found, those other young women were missing, not dead. No one had found them yet. But there were also a few women who they let go or who managed to escape, completely unaware of just how much suffering they actually managed to dodge. Norris ended up bragging about Shirley's death to another friend from prison, who ultimately reported his actions to police. Both were arrested and police raided their homes, finding all of their videos, pictures, and tools including acid that they plan to use on the next victim. And I do mean corrosive burn you acid, not dancing trees acid, just so we're clear. 
Norris confessed what they had done and requested a deal, claiming that Bittaker was the one who actually killed the girls. He dodged a death penalty and was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Bittaker, on the other hand, was sentenced to death, but he never made it to the end of his sentence. Both men died in prison of natural causes within the last few years. Now, for the rest of October, we are going to look at witches, monsters, ghosts, urban legends, and every other spooky-related crime that I can find. So, I hope that you guys got your fill of kidnapping and murder with this case. And of course, if you would like to discuss crimes that you just can't unhear, safe ways to get to the beach, or preferably anything and everything related to Halloween, feel free to contact me on Twitter or Instagram using the tag at that pod. Thanks, guys. <laughs>